Hey guys, welcome back to Portrait Sessions. So in this episode, we're gonna be talking about light modifiers. We're gonna be nerding out about light and the different things that we can do to change our light. And to help me talk about that, we have the beautiful Erica Kay. How's it going, Erica? Good, thanks, Nick. How are you? I am doing well. I'm recovering from the springtime cold that everybody seems to have. Um, it kind of comes with the warmer weather. I've I've got the nice sniffles and stuff, so I'll try not to hack and sneeze all <laughs> over my microphone. Nobody needs to see or hear that. Um, so it, it's, it should be noted that assuming we have no technical difficulties, we are recording video for this podcast mm -hmm. to kind of help visualize some of the stuff we're talking about. So if you go over to the go over to YouTube and do a search for Improve Photography, it'll be on that YouTube channel. So if you want to see our pretty faces, you can go over there. So in this episode, we're going to be talking about modifiers for speed lights. In a future episode, we'll talk about modifiers for studio lighting. But in this case, we're going to be talking about uh, modifiers for speed lights specifically. So where should we start, Erica? This is kind of a big um, topic. So I guess, yeah. I guess, uh, where should we start? Well, we could definitely talk about this for a really yes. long time. Um, but let's just start by talking a little bit about the images that we have here. Um, I what I did was I set up in my studio. Um, I set up a flash, and then I set my drug my boyfriend in there and. Um, <laughs> bribed him to be a model for me for a little bit. But um, so I placed him in front of my my uh, black backdrop and I set up a speed light um, off to the side about 45 degrees. It's probably about four feet away from him. Um, and what I did was I just did a series of photos with all of the different speed light modifiers that I have. Um, so we have some we have, you know, like a comparison here for you guys to check mm -hmm. out. It's both in the show notes. And then if you're watching the video, it's it, you can see right. it on the screen as well. But um, so what I did was I exposed, I got the proper exposure for the bare speed light first. Um, and then I just left my camera settings and the, the flash power exactly the same for all of the images because I want you to see exactly what each of these modifiers is doing to the light. So instead of getting a proper exposure every time and giving you a bunch of properly exposed images where you can't really tell the difference, um, you know, from each image, um, I just left everything exactly the same and just changed out the modifiers for each shot. So you can see exactly what these modifiers are doing to the light. You can mm -hmm. see, you know, how much they're modifying the light. You can see the shape that they're producing. You can see the shadows that they're producing. So when you look at this comparison, you're going to see some underexposed images and even some overexposed images, which was kind of surprising. Um, but just know that we did that so that you can really compare all these different modifiers yeah, and to the, each other. And this is a useful way of doing it because one of the things that people rarely talk about is the amount of light that that particular modifier gobbles up. Right. Like a, a lot of modifiers, they're, they're, they suck up a whole bunch of your light and you lose a lot of power. So this is mm -hmm. kind of a nice uh, demonstration to show you which modifiers suck up how much power and whatnot. So Right, right. Yeah. And it's much easier to, to talk about you know, what the modifier is doing to the light when you can see what it's doing um, for for this, you know, the same power on each image. Like mm -hmm. I said, if, if all of these were properly exposed and I went in and changed my settings every time I took a shot with a different modifier, you'd see basically the same image, maybe with just a different shape or size, yeah. um, to, you know, of the light, but you'd see the same exposure on every image. And that really just doesn't allow you to fully understand what these modifiers are doing. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So when we talk about light, there there's some kind of photographer lingo that gets thrown around. And sometimes, you know, when you hear that lingo and it hasn't been explained to you yet, you're like, you're thinking, what are they even talking about? So yeah. people talk, when they talk about quality of light, they talk about hard and soft light. And so I guess a good way of kind of describing what hard light versus soft light looks like it has to do with the transition from highlight to shadow. So when somebody's talking about a hard light source, they're talking typically about a very small light source. The smaller that light source is, the harder the shadows are going to be on the face or whatever it is, whatever the subject is. So we're talking about the transition from highlight to shadow. The sharper that that, that transition is, uh, the, the harder the light and the, the more graduated out that transition is the softer the light 
So like if you're in the middle of the day and it's noontime, harsh light, uh, you know, the, the shadows being cast underneath the brow or next to the nose are going to be very sharp. They're going to be very, you know, just abrupt. But if you are standing, ne if you have your subject standing next to a giant window and, and you look at those same shadows, those shadows are going to be very gradual and slowly transition into shadow. And that's mm -hmm. what they're talking about when people refer to soft light. Right. Mm hmm. And that is, if you want to be technical about it, um, the word for that is called penumbra. Penumbra. Um, yeah, penumbra. It's like the, the scientific explanation. So penumbra is just the transition between light to shadow. So if you're looking at an image and you're identifying, you know, maybe which direction the light's coming from mm -hmm. or the, the size and shape of the light or whatever, if you look at the penumbra, which is the transition from light to dark, mm -hmm. you'll be able to um, you'll be able to try to figure out what their light source was or what their modifier was because of that transition. Now, if we look at these sample images that I did, um, you know, Nick, as you said, if you have a smaller light source, you're going to have really harsh shadows or a really harsh penumbra. So, for example, if you look at um, in the, the sample images, if you look at the one with no modifier and if you look at the one with the magmod mag sphere, um, those are both pretty small mm -hmm. and you can see those harsh shadows like on the side of his nose, the other side of his face, you know, the side of his arm. You can see um, those really harsh penumbras there. Mm -hmm. But if you look at like the shoot through umbrellas, the, the Octobox and even like the the um, mag bounce a little bit mm -hmm. um, there, those transitions into the shadow are softer because you have a larger light source. The light is being spread further and it's, it's um, you know, it's not casting those shadows like the smaller light sources. Right. So <clears throat> the larger your light source is, the, the softer your light, your shadows are going to be. Um, and one of the biggest determining factors in how large your light source is, is, it's not necessarily the light source that you start off with. It's the proximity of that light source to your right. subject. So, you know, you can have a giant seven foot umbrella, but if you're a hundred feet away from your subject, it's going to be this, you know, just as harsh as the midday sun. But if you get that same modifier really close to your subject, it's going to be a large, soft light source because it's so much closer. Relatively, it's going to be much larger. So that that's why the sun is a harsh light source. The sun is huge, but mm -hmm. it's, you know, millions of miles away. So um, one of the biggest mistakes that I see photographers first getting into off camera flash, I see them having their light source too far away from their subject that, and so it turns that 43 un, uh, inch umbrella into a small light source. So mm -hmm. uh, the closer you can get that, that light source, the softer your light is going to be in general. Right. And you're, if you're like me, that like doesn't make sense to me. I feel like. <laughs> I feel like the closer it is, you know, the harsher it's going to be, the more shadows you're going to get, mm -hmm. like, it's not going to be good. I feel like you should pull it away. And when I was first learning off camera flash, I had such a hard time remembering yeah. that it's the opposite. You actually need to get it closer for it to be a nice, softer light instead of mm -hmm. pulling it away. Um, so just if you're like me and you think that that doesn't make sense, just like <laughs> tell your when you start to question that, tell yourself that you're wrong and question yourself again. And make sure that you're move you're thinking about moving the light toward mm -hmm. the subject instead of away. And so while we're on the subject of of uh, proximity with your light, mm -hmm. uh, it kind of brings up another term that gets thrown around, and that's fall off. Mm -hmm. So fall off is what happens when you get your light source really close to your subject, and in in getting your light source that close to your subject. The, the light or the the power of the light begins to fall off across the across your subject. So like, for example, to envision this, if you get a light source really close to somebody's head, like directly above head, it's going to be really bright on top of their head. And then as it goes down to their shoulders and then their waist, it's going to fall off rapidly mm -hmm. because it's so close. But if that same light source was, you know, 15 feet away, it's going to illuminate the, the entire body fairly uniformly. So the closer you get that 
light source, the more fall off there's going to be. And the further away, the more even it's going to be. So mm -hmm. that, that kind of brings in your artistic vision for it. But it's just one of those things. That's another one of those terms that gets thrown around where if you have, haven't had it explained to you, you don't know what people are talking about. Fall off? What? Um, but it's also kind of a neat um, effect that you can incorporate because it, it adds a very cinematic, dramatic look when you have you know, a lot of fall off from their head to their waist. It, it just kind of adds a artistic something. So, uh, right. And that totally right. has to do with proximity. Mm -hmm. And it also, you can also um, use modifiers to create that effect as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if you look at the samples that I did, you, you'll see that there are, there's quite a bit of difference in, in the fall off uh, on some of these images. So like the one without the modifier and the one with the mag mod mag grid, um, those you have, you know, his face and his chest area is is lit really well. And then it's just almost like a drastic change once it hits like mid chest. The rest of his body mm -hmm. is almost black. Um, so those are the ones where you're really kind of focusing the light, almost spotlighting right. the, the speed light. All the other ones like the umbrellas, the Octobox and the other Magmod products, the fall off is much more gradual. Um, and that's because you're spreading those, those uh, modifiers are spreading the light a little more than the, the uh, mag grid and then the bare speed light. Mm -hmm. And, and like we mentioned before, if you want to see these images, uh, go over to improve photography.com, click on podcast, then go to portrait session. And that's where you'll find the show notes. Mm -hmm. um, so let's talk about umbrellas versus soft boxes. I know that's one of the, you know, the, the biggest questions when you're first getting into off camera flash, like what's the, what's the difference in the way they look between a soft box and an umbrella. Mm -hmm. Um, so Erica, what do you think? Like if you had to describe the difference between the, the light that comes out of a soft box versus an umbrella, what, what's the difference in your opinion? Um, in my opinion, if you have good quality umbrellas and good quality soft boxes, it's not a huge difference. Mm -hmm. Um, the light is a little softer and a little more even with with a soft box um, or an Octobox or whatever. Um, but I think you can get really, really similar results with an umbrella, with a shoot through umbrella. Yeah. Um, the, I used it from the samples here. I have a 60 inch shoot through umbrella, a 30 inch shoot through and a 36 inch Octobox. And the results are really similar, especially in the 30 inch shoot through and the 36 Octobox. Mm -hmm. Um, there's not a lot of difference there in the quality of light, the, the, sh even the strength of light, they, they diffuse the light very, very similarly. Um, and in my opinion, it's so much easier to, to set up and carry and transport a shoot, a shoot through umbrella, yes. um, that I almost hardly ever use my Octobox or my soft boxes anymore, unless I'm in the studio. So I'm holding in my hand right now, a 43 inch umbrella from Westcott and it literally folds up to, I don't know, 16 inches long. Yeah. And then, and then it expands out into a full umbrella. And what's cool about that is it's very, very portable, very mobile, and they're actually really cheap too. An umbrella is a fraction of the cost of a soft box. Mm -hmm. the, the biggest difference between using a soft box and an umbrella, in my opinion, is controlling the direction of the light. Yes, exactly. So, if you set up an umbrella in a studio environment where you're trying to like have a dark background, uh, a lot of that light is going to just go everywhere. It's going to spill onto your background. It's going to spill onto the ceiling. Um, but a soft box, uh, the only direction that the light can go is forward because the outside of it is black. So mm -hmm. you really control the direction of the light, which a lot of times is really handy in a, in an indoor environment. But if you're shooting outside and an umbrella produces the same quality of the light for, um, you know, a fraction of the cost. But another downside to an umbrella is it's like a sail. If you set yeah. it up outside and it's windy, good luck trying to keep yeah, your you're flying away. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you put you set up a seven foot umbrella and you are Mary Poppins flying into the next county right. if it's windy outside. So, uh, you know, there's a lot of downsides to umbrellas as well. Right. One of the things that I've I've really been using a lot lately that I enjoy are those are the soft boxes that set up really quickly. They're mm -hmm. the, like I just got uh, I can't remember the name of it. I'll have I'll talk about it in a future episode, I'm sure. But I don't remember the name of the brand, but it's 
is basically a 38 inch uh, softbox that just boom pops up. It actually mm-hmm. might be 42 inches or 48 inches. It might be 48 inches. I think it's 48, but it's a really large softbox. And you can set it up with a speed light and it sets up in like seconds rather than the, you know, a typical softbox you're having to deal with the rods and stuff. Right. It's really slow. Uh, but it was also like a $250 modifier. Mm-hmm. You can buy a 60 inch umbrella for like 75, 80 bucks. Mm-hmm. So they're much more expensive, but they don't catch the wind and you can control the direction. So right. that, that's and the I, biggest difference. Is. Right. And I think you make a really good point about controlling the direction of the light because, mm-hmm. um, you know, that's something that you really only need to do. Like you said, if you're working indoors or if you're doing something super creative in like maybe a night, a night yeah. photo or something yeah, exactly. where you really don't want to light up the background because mm-hmm. you're going to get that that light is going to spill all over the place when you're using the shoot shoot through umbrella um, because there's nothing to capture or to trap the light in. When you have an octobox or a soft box, like you said, the out, the, the outside of it is black and it's almost, you know, like shooting into a cave and, and it's pointing out through the front. So the light is trapped and it's, it's going to be, it's only going to go in the direction that you have the, the soft box pointed to. So mm-hmm. if you're doing like a night photo with a cut, with a, a subject, and you really want to to um, make sure that light is going in the in the direction that you want it to go in. Use the soft box or a soft box or an octobox or any even any of the the mag mods I found are really good for that. Yeah. Um, but that's the only time you really need it because the quality, the difference in the quality of light is just not enough, in my opinion, to have to deal with the hassle of an octobox um, all day long at a wedding or mm-hmm. constantly at a at a shoot. Um, it's just not worth it to me. Yeah. And another thing to keep in mind is the shape of your, uh, your, your thing, <laughs> brain fart, <laughs> the, the shape of your, oh, key, help me out here, Erica. Your well, modifier? Your modifier. There we go. <laughs> uh, brain farts and being sick. It happens. It happens to the best of it. So uh, the, the shape of your modifier has a lot to do with the way your catch lights look in a person's eyes. So if you're using a big square or rectangle shaped softbox, a lot of times the catch lights in the eyes are kind of weird. In my opinion, Mm -hmm. my favorite catch lights are those nice round catch lights in the eyes uh, created from either an umbrella or like a beauty dish or Mm -hmm. even a a ring light, something like that. Um, So that's something to keep in mind is like, what do you want the catch lights in the eyes to look like? Because whatever you're illuminating them with, that's going to be the shape of their catch lights. So uh, it's a small thing, but it is kind of a, it's a, if you're doing like really tight uh, cropped portraiture, portraits, um, yeah. you really notice those catch lights. So yeah, uh, consider that when you're getting ready to set up. Mm-hmm. And you, that's definitely something to consider when you are doing um, like corporate headshots, mm-hmm. um, because those are typically tighter and they need to be a little bit more professional. And, and yeah. you don't, you don't always get that creative um, freedom with mm-hmm. those. So you definitely want to make sure that you have something that's going to look realistic um, in the catch lights for something like that. Or you can be crazy and be like Peter Hurley and have like big, long, crazy looking right. catch lights. Yeah. Like strip boxes. Exactly. And that's a really yeah. creative look as well. That's mm-hmm. um, one of my favorite soft boxes that I have is just like a, it's a strip box where it's like, I believe it's the dimensions of mine are like 16 inches by 43 inches. So they're really mm-hmm. long and narrow. And you can create some really unique uh, catch lights in the eyes. And because they're long, you can set them on top and on bottom of your person's uh, face. Yep. And you get that butterfly effect and mm-hmm. you get a soft light across their face. But you also get a lot of definition uh, because they're so narrow. So it's a, you can play with different shapes. They're, they're really fun and right. uh, have fun with your catch lights. Yeah. And if you want to try to do something like that on a budget without having to go out and spend a bunch of money on strip boxes because they're not cheap, yeah. um, something that you can do, it's kind of a hack uh, DIY thing. If you use a um, like a boom arm or something and hang up a white sheet and then set your set your speed light on one side of it and then your subject on the other side. So the speed light's shooting through that white sheet. It's going to produce a long rectangular catch light in the That's eye. Cool. It's going to look like a strip box. It's going to save you a lot of money. <laughs> Very cool. You can set up two of those, you know, like kind of side by side and shoot through the middle of them so that mm-hmm. there are um, catch lights 
going, what is that, vertically yeah. on either side of their pupil. It's really cool. You can get creative That's with cool. it for sure. And, you know, another thing, it's kind of a specialty thing, but ring lights are something we haven't really talked about. They're typically used for, you know, like macro photography and stuff, but you mm -hmm. can get some really um, interesting catch lights in the eyes by using ring lights. I personally have never like invested in a decent one, uh, but I've seen some really cool results. It, it mm -hmm. produces a very flat, almost like um, pop up flash kind of look because it's just like flat. Like there yeah. are no shadows when you have a ring light because the ring goes around your lens. So there are no shadows, but mm -hmm. the catch lights in the eyes are kind of the whole point of that. They produce right. a really cool catch light. Um, I don't know if it's cool enough to want to invest in it it's a very unique look but mm -hmm. it's it's also a look that's kind of gaining in popularity a little bit yeah we have um a ring light and some strip boxes at the studio so when we do the, the studio lighting um episode i will do some samples with those lights so you guys can oh, see cool. what exactly we're talking about very cool so We've talked about umbrellas. We've talked about uh, soft boxes. Uh, something we haven't really talked about are the different modifiers that you can put just right on the end of your speed light. Mm -hmm. So Eric and I both use mag mods and I'm growing. At, they're growing on me. I, <laughs> I really enjoy using the mag mods. Pr primarily what I'm using them for are the grids. Anytime that you have your flashes back behind a person and you're kind of shooting back towards the subject, but you don't want a whole bunch of lens flare, the grids are really good for that mm -hmm. because they, they direct the light. And because the, because you have them in an angle and you cannot see the surface of your flash, the camera, the lens can't see the surface of your flash. You're not going to get tons and tons of lens flare like you would typically get. So it's really good for uh, rim lighting subjects without getting a bunch of lens flare back in your, into your camera. And mm -hmm. I really like the, using the gels Gel, the gel system is probably my favorite just because you can so quickly and easily change colors. Um, you can just slap them on. They, they go on magnetically. Really, really like the gels. Uh, they're handy anytime that you either want to uh, make the ambient light a different color than it is. For example, mm -hmm. I recently did a shoot with a band and I wanted to turn the sky like a magenta purple. And so I put green... Uh, green gels on my speed light, my main light for the subjects. And when I counteracted and, and balanced that light out, it turned all the ambient light kind of a magenta purple. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it can be a really cool effect if you're just wanting to play around and get really colorful with your portraits. Right. Yeah. It's, those are super cool. I've loved playing with those at weddings, especially I'll throw them on, I'll throw the gels on maybe during the reception. I'll put them yes. in like the colors of their wedding and then you'll have, you know, just like people will be highlighted in pink or blue or whatever the color is of the wedding. And I'll still have my my non gelled flashes out, mm -hmm. too. So, you know, those will be used as key lights. It's just the, the gelled um, the gelled lights are used as just kind of a highlight. Um, and it it looks really cool. Yeah, it adds that kind of nightclub -y, glowy kind exactly. of look when you're shooting yeah. back into your flashes at a reception. Mm -hmm. I love doing that as well. Um, I recently shot a band that they were playing in this really dimly lit and small little nightclub and the lighting for the band just sucked. It was not strong. It was not colorful and it didn't change. So what I did was I threw on a couple gels on my two different flashes and then I was playing around with the powers and the angles and stuff. And I was able to create some nice colorful live performance nice. photos um, just using my gels and I didn't have to use those crazy high ISOs because if I was using the available light, we we're talking like ISO 8,000 and things just get really yucky about then. But by adding my own flashes, I was able to get a very similar look. It didn't look like flash, but I was shooting at like ISO 1000 and that helps dramatic and dramatically. Yeah. Um, some of the other MagMod products um, that I tested here are the MagSphere and the MagBounce. Mm -hmm. um, so I did the grid as well, but I know, Nick, you touched on the grid a little bit already, but the MagSphere and the MagBounce um, gave me some pretty interesting results as well. Um, the MagSphere actually is one that I thought kind of made my image overexposed, uh, which is interesting because it's a modifier. You know, it's supposed to, you know, do a little something less to the light. Mm -hmm. um, and it kind of did the opposite. So it did overexpose the image a little bit, but I, I like the 
the fall off and I like what it did to the background. It actually hit the background quite a, quite a bit and created a lighter circle around him, which is something that I do a lot when I'm doing headshots. And I just put another, um, I put another strobe behind the subject pointing to the background to make this kind of light area on the background. And with the mag sphere, I didn't even have to do that. Cool. You know, it just kind of created one on, on its own, <clears throat> um, which was really interesting. Um, and like a, a diffuser, like the, the mag sphere, basically mm -hmm. what it's doing is it's taking your, your speed light and it's turning it into a light bulb because <laughs> right. it, yeah. because it goes 360 degrees and it just becomes a light source that goes in every direction. Mm -hmm. And that's actually a really cool effect because, um, there's lots of times where you need to illuminate an area, not just the subject. So because it goes in 360 degrees, you can get some really natural looking results mm -hmm. just by getting it overhead and it, it mimics a light bulb. And, right. and we're very, as people that are in buildings fairly often, we're used to seeing that look. So it looks very natural when you use it that way. And it, it helps get a little bit of ambient light as well. Um, in the in the rest of the room, it fills the room, but um, you can get it close to your subject and illuminate your subject as well. So right. I'm very excited about that mag sphere. I don't have one, but I want one. I really like it. I used it. Um, I used it at several weddings toward the end of the season last year, and I really liked it. I used it a lot for like family portraits and stuff like that. Um, and it was mm -hmm. really useful. And when I sat down and talked to Travis, who is the CEO of MagMod, he compared that to a shoot through umbrella. And you'll see that it does produce similar results in, in, in the fact that it spreads the light out. That's um, and then the other thing was the mag bounce. And he compared that one more to a soft box or an octa box because it's actually kind of capturing the light and then directing it mm -hmm. um, a certain into, you know, a certain direction. And when you look at the, the comparison of the mag bounce to like the, uh, the octa box um, in my sample here, you'll see that the light looks very, very similar did something kind of funky to the white balance and to the color of his skin, Interesting. Um, which was weird for me because it's white. The, the, the modifier itself is white. Um, so that was kind of weird, but in terms of the quality of the light and the fall off and the shadows and all that kind of stuff, it looks a lot like <clears throat> a, a soft box or an octa box. So for those of you that have not seen a mag sphere or a mag bounce, um, it, if you had to describe it, it would be like a light scoop. It's like yeah. a, it's like a dome that is open on one side. So it's got a back side and it's kind of scooped forward. And then the front side is open. And so there's a couple different ways you could use that. You could turn it around backwards to where the open side is back. And mm -hmm. then it's going to bounce the light off the wall behind you. And then that front side will add just a tiny little catch light and filled in the eyes. Mm -hmm. Or you can turn it around and it'll really direct the light forward towards your subject. And it'll create that, that effect that she's talking about where it kind of shoots the light towards the subject and not so much of it is going to go and hit walls and stuff. So it's very interesting. The, the thing about that, that, that turns me off to it is how floppy it is. It's like this <laughs> big gelatin floppy thing that you put on your, on your speed light. Uh -huh. And I just, I can't like with a straight face, take it out in public <laughs> because, <laughs> yeah. because it's just so floppy and silly looking that I feel a little bit like a clown. Yeah. Um, so another one that another mag mod thing, we're starting to sound like a mag mod commercial, <laughs> but uh, another one they have is this mag snoot that I'm holding in my hand right now. And what's cool mm -hmm. is it goes on just like all the other mag mod stuff magnetically and it's a snoot. And what a snoot does is it directs the light into a very tight little beam. So you can add like spotlight effects from a distance away. And it's just going to add a little splash of light in a very, very directed uh, way. So mm -hmm. just a tiny little spotlight of light. And it easily um, changes the amount of, uh, I guess, directionality to where you can kind of condense it down into something that's going to be a little bit wider or you can extend it fully out and it'll be very directional snoots are interesting they're very a very specialized kind of thing they're at yeah. nice for adding kind of a cinematic little splash of light onto something but it's not something you're going to be lighting a bunch of portraits with it's it's a very specialized kind of thing exactly yeah so I guess that is, uh, I mean, we could talk about this for days, <laughs> We really could. Uh, but th that really kind of covers it. You know, umbrellas are great because they're affordable and great quality of light. Uh, 
soft boxes are great because they're they you can control the direction of the light. Uh, they're a little bit more expensive, but at least you don't turn in Mary Poppins when you're using them. <laughs> yeah. Uh, grids are great for c- c- controlling the spill of light. Um, yeah, that's that's pretty much it. One thing we didn't really talk about that I guess we could mention is uh, the kind of umbrellas, like a, a silver lined umbrella that you shoot the flash into and then it bounces out of it and comes back to your mm-hmm. subject. Uh, me personally, um, I don't use those because the anytime you're using like a silver lined anything, whether it's the silver side of a five in one reflector or a silver lined umbrella, the light that comes out of it has lots of what's called specular highlights. Mm-hmm. And basically what that means is it looks very glossy. It it's hard to describe, I guess, but it's it, almost like a mirror. Like if you're reflecting light yeah, with a mirror, it's it's like a very it's it's soft yet it's harsh and yeah. and so like it's hard to describe but i don't like the way it looks basically and because mm-hmm. uh just the physics of it you have to have your flash you shoot it up into an umbrella and then it comes back towards your subject you can't get that umbrella as close to your subject as you could a normal shoot through umbrella therefore it's always going to be a little bit harsher because you can't get it very close uh in proximity so uh, when we think about those kind of umbrellas, we think about school portraits. They used to always use those, uh, yeah. Sears. That's what they use. They never use the shoot through and like a soft box, it controls the direction of the light fairly mm-hmm. well. Not as good as a soft box, but it does control the direction. Uh, but it, it's always a harsher light and you can't get it as close. So I always prefer a shoot through umbrella. I did too. And I don't even have one of the yeah. the other kinds of umbrellas. And I was thinking about that when I was putting this together, I thought maybe I should go rent one and just see what it looks like. But you know, not very many people use those anymore and the light is just not that great. So no. I didn't even yep. waste my time and my money. Exactly. <laughs> so don't, don't waste your time or your money either. A shoot through umbrella, <laughs> yeah. umbrella is not only cheaper, but it's better and it's softer and it's just right. better and better and better. <laughs> so, all right. So that pretty much does it for this episode. Erica, where can people go to check out your work and, and to keep up with what, everything that you're doing? Uh, you guys can see my wedding engagement stuff at Erica K Photography, as always. And then if you want to see more of the studio work and what's going on um, with Boudoir and all the other stuff that we're doing in the studio, uh, you can find me at UA Creative Photo on both Instagram and Facebook. That's so cool. You are keeping very busy over there, Erica. Oh, I am. So you can find me at Instagram. Yes, Instagram. I've been posting Woo! more to Instagram, mostly my landscape photography. But if you do a search for Nick Page Photography on Instagram, you can find me there. Or you can find all the workshops and Skype lessons that I do over at NickPagePhotography.com. Thank you guys so much for joining us in this episode, and we will see you in another seven days. Bye-bye. Views expressed on this program by independent host guests and callers do not necessarily reflect the views of Improved Photography LLC or its advertisers. Some links mentioned on this program are affiliate links where a commission is earned.